everyone, and welcome to our third annual Autism Hope Summit. I'm so excited for our next speaker. I know that you're just going to learn so much stuff, and he's going to be talking about something that's just so, so important to our community. I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Fry, and today we're going to be talking about autism and seizures. So thank you for being here, Dr. Fry. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. Well, I know this topic is huge, as we know, in the autism community, but before we get started, I want people to know a little bit more about your background and why you're so passionate about helping the autism community. Sure, yeah. Um, so by training, I'm a child neurologist, so one of the reasons why I seem to know a little bit about seizures. Um, but um, I have an interesting um, history of how I got into autism. You know, I um, after doing my training in in child neurology, I was actually very interested in learning disabilities, and I did a uh, fellowship in learning disabilities and behavioral neurology. But what I found is the patients that came to me, their children didn't so much have learning disabilities. And this was uh, about the early 2000s, um, um, and it, when autism was on the rise, and a lot of parents came to me and said, my child's just been diagnosed with autism. They don't know what causes it. They don't know what to do about it. I think it has something to do with the brain, and you're a neurologist, so maybe you could tell me. <laughs> and uh, so I took it as a challenge. No pressure, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so I took it as a challenge to try and figure out, you know, what it was about, what caused it, and what could be done about it. And, um, and it was very funny because after, you know, that time I did my uh, uh, training, um, I had my first job and my second job, and at each point, um, every time I uh, opened up a new practice um, in, in academia, um, uh, that's what the same thing would happen is parents would come to me with their children with autism and would say, um, you know, I hear you're an expert in the brain and behavioral neurology and, and um, there's this thing called autism and maybe you could tell me something about it. And what eventually happened is, of course, none of my colleagues really knew how to treat the children with autism. So they heard, oh, you see children with autism? You can have all of mine. <laughs> and wow. before I knew it, that's the only uh, population um, that I was seeing of children was children wow. with autism. And I had officially make what I called my medically based autism clinic because I looked at it from more of a medical point of view than a behavioral point of view. Absolutely. And it, wow, I mean, I guess there's always a reason for everything. And now you're one of our leading top doctors in autism. And honestly, thankful for whomever kind of pushed you in that direction, because I know you've helped thousands and thousands of families. When we're talking about seizures, I know that they're all not created equal. And so before we start talking about and diving into these questions, I know a lot of families might not really understand even really what a seizure is. So can we maybe give a definition of, you know, what, what is a seizure? Sure. Oh, it's, a, it's a great question, you know, and um, there, there's two things, right? There's seizures and there's epilepsy. So I like to talk about both. Okay. Um, seizures are when the electrical activity of the brain um, becomes what we call synchronized. So usually all the uh, billions of neurons in your brain are kind of firing, um, which, tell, which transmits information kind of randomly to kind of tell each other, you know, different things. But sometimes what happens is they all synchronously fire at the same time, which is very abnormal. And what that does is it kind of shuts the brain down and the brain um, starts uh, to have this, uh, this rhythm of all the, the neurons firing at the same time. And when uh, what commonly we see and we think about seizures, we see us think about jerking of the limbs. And that mm -hmm. happens when this kind of synchronous activity gets to what we call the motor cortex, the part of the brain that makes your limbs move. Um, and that's why you see if somebody has a seizure, usually you see their, um, their limbs jerking in a rhythmic fashion. And that represents this rhythmic synchronized activity in the brain. Um, and usually where we... Um, think about it as a generalized seizure. Somebody falls on the floor and they have this rhythmic activity for some um, period of time and then it stops usually within a minute or so and they have what we call a post-ictal period where the brain is kind of stunned and that can last anywhere from minutes uh, to hours. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's what we call a generalized seizure when the whole brain is like that. But sometimes it may be a very small portion of the brain, which mm -hmm. we call a partial or a focal seizure that is one part of the brain seems to have this abnormal activity and it's not working right and if it's a if that happens to be attached to 
a part of the brain that controls um, what we call the motor center that controls your limbs, you may see jerking of one of the arms, one of the legs, maybe the face. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if it's in another part of the brain that affects your thinking or your speech, you can actually see that interrupted for a short period of time. Um, so there's all different types of seizures uh, that can occur. And in autism, we do see every different type of seizure. Mm -hmm. um, many times we see what we call multifocal seizures, where multiple parts of the brain seem to have this um, abnormal electrical activity. And then we have to also differentiate that, if that's not complex enough, <laughs> we have to differentiate that from what we call subclinical uh, seizure discharges or epileptiform discharges, which aren't really seizures. They're seizure-like activity that occurs in small parts of the brain. And they're kind of like if you would think of a car, like your car backfiring. So it just, uh, that part of the brain just isn't working for just a millisecond or two or, um, um, or maybe a second. And, uh, and it's controversial as far as whether that's really significant to the way the brain works. Um, that is, when, uh, when you have these subclinical discharges, um, sometimes if it's in a crucial area of the brain, like the language area, and you have lots of these kind of backfirings in um, the language area, sometimes we think it is significant. But at other times, it may not be. Um, and uh, that's one of the challenges in, in treating seizures and also subclinical um, um, epileptiform activity. Now, seizures um, and epilepsy are related, but they're not exactly the same thing. So the definition of epilepsy is to have two unprovoked seizures. So that is, you can have seizures that are provoked um, because you may have a fever, or you may have a traumatic brain injury, or something else, you may have an infection um, that causes that, and those may be provoked seizures. But if you have unprovoked seizures, and you have more than one, that's a definition of epilepsy. And epilepsy is actually pretty common um, in the typically uh, developing population. Um, about uh, one, well, about, uh, about uh, probably about 8% of typically developing children will have a seizure. About one to two go on to develop epilepsy. One to 2%, mm -hmm. sorry, one to 2% um, go on to develop epilepsy. Most children that develop epilepsy have epilepsy for a very short period of time, maybe a year or two, and it resolves on its own. Okay. So, it, uh, so in, in the typically developing population, it can be very benign, that is, and just kind of a, a, kind of a hiccup in development. Okay. Um, in autism, you know, it's a little bit different. Um, that is that we tend to see um, many more children with autism. The, the rates vary, but it may be up to 30 or 40% of children with autism may have seizures at some point in their life. Mm -hmm. um, and they tend to be more refractory. That is, they're harder to treat, um, and many times um, they go on for longer periods of time. And I know that especially in the autism community, there's different types of seizures where some of the symptoms, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, where they might just have staring spells, or and it doesn't always necessarily be a ch as a child that might shake or, or you know, fall to the ground. It literally could be a, a brief one to two seconds, even longer or so, staring spell, and then they go on about whatever they were doing. Um, so that also could be a, a seizure type activity. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct, and, and that's what I was kind of alluding to in some of these kind of focal seizures, that is where you may have um, um, epilepsy or epileptiform discharges in parts of the brain that um, may not um, be responsible for your motor functions, but may be important for the way you think or you speak. Um, and sometimes you may have very subtle staring episodes where somebody will just stare into space. If um, it's in the language area, actually we see some people will actually be talking. They'll stop talking for several seconds and then start off where they left off and won't even realize that they had uh, stopped um, talking for that period of time. Um, in children with autism, especially those that don't have language, it may manifest as um, uh, very um, subtle staring episodes. Um, and um, it's very important in those cases to do what we call an extended EEG or an overnight EEG to see if there is any activity to capture the episode and to see how severe the abnormalities in their brain waves are. 
um, because, of course, many children with autism also have what we call, you know, stereotyped movements, mm -hmm. um, or um, they can have tics, or they can other have other types of movement disorders that may look like seizures and may be very difficult um, to distinguish. And it's very important to find out um, what the answer is there so that we can treat um, those correctly. So you had mentioned that, you know, close to 40% of the population with autism uh, could have some type of seizure activity or a form of epilepsy. Why is that? It's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. And, you know, why this one particular uh, group um, has this. The other thing is, it seems as though that I hear often that it happens often in puberty um, with these, uh, especially boys, from what I read, and I could be wrong, but uh, why the such a high percentage? Yeah, so great, really great questions, you know, and a lot to unpack in there. <laughs> so, um, so, so the reason why um, seizures are so prevalent in autism, we're really trying to figure out. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is we think some of, sometimes some of the same brain disorders that cause autism also cause seizures, some of what we call the neuropathology, or how the brain doesn't work. That is that um, one of the uh, themes in um, understanding autism is that we think that the brain, the outside of the brain called the cortex, mm -hmm. the outside part where you, outside where you do your thinking, is very hyper excitable. You know, and that every time you have nerve impulses, you have to excite nerves, but then you also have to have a balance that calms them down, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what we find is that um, that area that calms them down um, is out of balance as um, re in regards to the part that excites them. Um, so we find that the, the cortex or um, the part of the brain where you think is too hyper excitable. But we find that same uh, theme in, in um, epilepsy too. You know, we think that that's one of the reasons why um, all of your neurons actually get very hyper excitable and then uh, may, uh, may have this you know, seizure-like activity because um, they, uh, they get excited too much um, and, uh, and they synchronize themselves and, and have uh, seizures. So we think some of the same, what we call pathology, or the same reasons why the neurons aren't working in autism are similar to why they're not working um, in, uh, in, in epilepsy. Then again, also we find that um, children that tend to have genetic disorders Mm -hmm. tend to have, and, and autism, tend to have higher rates of epilepsy, too. Not exactly clear why that is, but we know that that's the case, too, that if you have a genetic disorder, which we know occurs in somewhere about 20 or 30 percent of children with autism, um, they tend to have higher rates of epilepsy, too. So it's not exactly um, clear why that is, but we know that's, that's uh, a reason. Now, you had another really good question about when you actually see epilepsy emerge in children mm -hmm. with autism. And we find there's really two peaks. One is be, be before the age of five, mm -hmm. you know, before the age of five, and, and, and sometimes very early on. So if you have seizures actually predating the autism, very bad, um, uh, what we call refractory epilepsy that's hard to control, predating the autism, we know that's a, not a very good prognostic factor. Okay, and in that case, it may be something that's associated with why you have the epilepsy that's causing the autism. And then later on, if you tend to have seizures after you're developed autism um, in those years between probably about two and five, um, uh, we know that those children uh, tend to have what we call partial complex seizures or, or these seizures that are only in specific parts of the brain, which can look like staring episodes, which you um, alluded to. Mm -hmm. Many times they have these, uh, what we um, talked about of these subclinical epileptiform discharges at those ages. And then uh, it tends, um, after you get after that age, about five or six, um, you tend not to see new onset um, seizures in children with autism until you get to the teenage years. Mm -hmm. um, and then the teenage years, for some reason, there seems to be new onset um, uh, seizures in epilepsy. Um, and uh, one of the things that's very worrisome is that when you look at mortality rates of why um, individuals with autism die, especially in young adulthood, one of the major causes is epilepsy and seizures. Mm -hmm. So for some reason, we think that there's um, this kind of second wave of a development of seizures and epilepsy. Um, we're not exactly sure why that occurs. We don't know how to predict that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that tends to be um, a little bit um, more prevalent in lower functioning individuals. Um, but um, um, at this point, what it seems is that there is this uh, second increase in prevalence. And, mm -hmm. and if it's not diagnosed, it's not treated, it actually could have um, some real consequences. And when you bring that up, um, and I don't know if you know this or not, my son uh, recently got diagnosed with epilepsy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and so um, we've known each other for many years, and this is uh, something new uh, happened in uh, September. So it's uh, we now have that membership card now, um, and we hit puberty, and it just we're one of these you know, families that were in the 40% the bracket now, right, of that. Um, and when, you know, families are listening to this, I can tell you just from my own personal experience, I, I didn't understand anything to do with seizures um, up until this. I thought I always had empathy for the families. I thought I kind of understood. But until you've gone through one or multiple uh, types of seizures, um, you just, I can't even describe it to you. It's, it's because it's a different, it's a, just a different animal. Um, Very scary. It really is scary. Um, I wasn't home for the first seizure. I was actually at work. Um, I get a text. The ambulance was on its way. Um, he was actually unconscious. Um, it was a very scary moment. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about the mortality rate, I, and I was thinking out loud, or you know, not out loud, but thinking, <laughs> thinking nonetheless. Um, I remember uh, not, not that long ago, a few months ago, when he had his last one. Luckily, it feels as though we're under, we're, 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 we found a medication that seems to be working, so we're just holding on to that. Um, but I know I was going to the restroom, and I had just started hearing like kind of a gurgling noise, and he was having a seizure, and he was choking. Um, is that one way that a child, I, I'm believing, um, can uh, potentially... Um, unfortunately lose their life by choking is that I know falling and hitting their head we all know about uh, John Travolta's you know child and 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 the sadness that came about um, but for me that was a big moment hearing that choking thinking gosh if I wasn't going to the bathroom at that exact moment what could have happened I don't know you know so I'll say that um, seizures are very scary mm -hmm. they, they are scary for the most part, usually um, they're more scary than they are dangerous to the individual. But well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. So, so they are they are really scary. Um, yeah. but most seizures, most generalized seizures, you know, last for less than a minute, mm -hmm. um, and they self resolve. Um, and they kind of reset. It looks like sometimes, like, and they're all different. Like at least with my son, he's had all different types. It feels, but they'll kind of reset at moments where they'll have a seizure, they'll stop, and they'll kind of just stare. Um, and sometimes that stare, as you said earlier, they last for a while. And then sometimes it just, he'll, he'll kind of come back. And he's not exactly how he was prior, but um, he, he's not, you know, he, he seems to kind of get through it and be okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they are very scary. So, you know, I don't want to minimize them, you know, in any ways. Uh, I will say something that's really important. So uh, about 10 years ago, Jim Adams and I um, did a study, a national survey of um, families that had children with autism and epilepsy uh, to find out what treatments actually worked uh, best for the children um, and other uh, different uh, information. One thing that was very concerning is that we found that only about 50% of the families reported that they were prescribed a rescue medication. Oh, wow. A rescue medication is very important. And that is used to stop seizures that go on for a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, many times we say that if a seizure goes on for more than five minutes, you want to stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are a little bit more conservative and they say three minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to work with your doctor. But what's most important is that you have one of these rescue medications. So you can stop a seizure that goes on for any prolonged period of time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that um, we associate with mortality in seizures is something called status epilepticus. And that's when a seizure goes on for a long period of time and can't be stopped. It ends up that the, the body is pretty robust, so it takes about um, 20 minutes for a seizure really to start to do damage to the body, which is a very long time. It's a very long time, yeah. So we, um, so we say that if a seizure goes on for more than five minutes, to give a rescue medication to try and stop it. Mm -hmm. Usually that works, not always. A lot of times you'll have a second dose to use um, in case um, you need to, to do that, in case, mm -hmm. in case the child needs a second dose. I always tell families, especially if they're new to epilepsy and seizures, that as soon as you give the rescue medication, to call 911. 
Mm-hmm. So if you have an ambulance there, the child may recover just fine, but you want to make sure that in case they don't, in case the seizure doesn't stop, you have professionals on the way that can give a higher level of medication to stop the seizures. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we want to prevent status epilepticus, and that's the really the number one um, cause of death from seizures. There's also something called SUDEP, or Sudden Unexplained Death Associated with Epilepsy, um, which is very scary. Um, and that happens because we think that um, sometimes the um, systems that control the heart and the lungs may become unstable when a child has a seizure or when they have a subclinical seizure that you may not even see. We know that um, making sure that you take your medications, your anti-epileptic medications, reduce, reduces the risk of SUDEP. So it's always important to give the child um, or the individual um, the anti-epileptic medication that they need and not to skip doses so that they will make sure that they reduce their risk of uh, SUDEP also. Um, during a seizure, yeah, you can have gurgling noises, as you mentioned. Um, a lot of times during what we call the tonic phase, when the whole body becomes very stiff, mm-hmm. the diaphragm, which is the muscle that controls your breathing, becomes very stiff, and you're not breathing completely. The child isn't breathing completely, and you can see what we call cyanosis or blueness around the, the mouth. Usually that's very short-lived, mm-hmm. um, and usually during the other parts of the seizure, there is breathing, although it might be shallow. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, and usually we don't see um, a lot of choking as, um, as a... Oh, well, that makes me feel, but I put them on his side just to be, that, you know, that's what I did. Exactly. And so that's really the best because the, the one thing with kind of the choking that we would worry about is what we call aspiration. Mm-hmm. The stomach contents come up and can go into the lungs, um, and that can cause an infection. It can block the lungs and prevent you from breathing. So what we suggest is put the individual on their side so that if um, they do have, if they do kind of throw up at all, that it comes out of the mouth and it doesn't go back down into the lungs. Um, of course, don't put anything in their mouth. I know many years ago, many decades ago, we used to think about putting something in the individual's mouth to prevent them from swallowing their tongue, so to speak, but that doesn't really happen. So we do not um, recommend actually putting anything in the mouth, but turning them on their side mm-hmm. is a good idea. Making sure that they're in a place where they're not going to injure themselves, where there's no hard surfaces, um, uh, making sure they're on the floor in, in some way that, uh, that they won't injure themselves is a good way. And, and usually, you know, most seizures only uh, last for about one to two minutes and then they stop on their own. Mm-hmm. If they go on longer, of course, uh, a rescue medication is needed to stop them. And when I know sometimes too, this has only happened twice, um, we've had a total of six seizures, which six too many if you ask me. But, um, you know, luckily we have great doctors, you know, like yourself uh, out there, you know, helping so many of our, our communities and doctors that all learn from one another. Um, but it was really new when the bodily functions also something for you guys to also know is sometimes they, when they have a seizure, uh, they lose bodily functions. Um, they could vomit. Um, they could bite their tongue briefly. I mean, my son did bite his tongue, but it wasn't anything to be too concerned over. Um, more our concern was trying to just get him to a safe spot, um, to where he wasn't going to hit his head, you know, just to make sure it was over. And then after it was done, we obviously cleaned him up and then got him to a restful, you know, state and monitored him. Um, but you know, why do they lose their, their, why do sometimes they have a seizure, they lose their bodily functions and sometimes they don't. Right. So, um, so for the most part, that's, 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 um, it's talked about more than it actually happens. Okay. Yeah, it's only happened, at, like, like I said, we only had that happen that time, but the, or two times, I should say, but the, um, the other ones, it didn't. So it was like, you know, you're waiting for it, and then you're like, oh, okay, that, that didn't happen this time. And, yeah. you know, I Google stuff, and I get nervous to Google because there's so much information, and you just don't know which is good and which is not so good. So I like to hear from you. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it, it tends to be the fact that um, when, when the brain has this, especially if it's a generalized seizure, so mm-hmm. you usually see those in generalized seizures more than focal seizures. And that's because when in generalized seizure, the entire brain um, has this abnormal electrical activity and it can send um, the wrong messages down to the lower parts of the brain um, that control the bodily functions. And that's what we worry about with... Um, what we call status epilepticus, because when that happens, if those uh, messages go for too long a period of time, they can send the wrong messages for, um, for breathing and for the, um, the, um, 
uh, for regulating the heart and the blood pressure. Um, uh -huh. but, um, but, you know, sometimes we see that those messages go down, especially during generalized seizures and affect the other bodily functions. But uh, luckily that doesn't happen all that much. It's more talked about. Yeah. yeah. It occurs. Well, and it's interesting because I don't know if it's just us, but I've talked to lots of other families. It seems as though with autism, there doesn't seem to be one standard type of seizure, even within your own family. So like with our son, we've had multiple, like we've had some like that. We've had some that, you know, a little bit of kind of moving fell out of the ground. Then it was, I don't know, a minute or so later, he got back up and acted as though nothing, even though I know, we just had, he almost looked drunk falling down is the only way I can kind of explain it. Yeah. Um, and then sat for a minute or so and got up, rested, I don't know, a couple minutes and then went about his day and looked nothing like, you know, the others. Um, and so, but I've talked to other families and they've kind of given me the same kind of thing. It was like, oh yeah, that's how my son is too, or my daughter is. It, there's not like one type. So even when you have seizures, there's not always like the same Type of is that normal with um, epilepsy in general, or is that just what we see in the autism community? It's probably a little bit more prevalent in the autism community. So, um, kind of uh, standard seizures that um, that um, that tend to resolve over time. Yeah, they seem to be what we call stereotype. They're always almost the same way. Um, but uh, many times, when we have complex seizures or complex uh, complex um, um, uh, seizure phenomenons. Uh, they tend to be like this, where you see different types of seizures at different times. And a lot of uh, times families think that there might be some meaning to that, like it might be a progression or an improvement. And for the most part, it, it's, um, it's just that it manifests different ways. And one of the reasons is that most of the time we say what we um, uh, call these uh, multifocal seizures, where you have multiple parts of the brain um, that have this abnormal seizure activity. Um, so it may be that um, the seizure starts out from one part at one point or starts out from another point um, at another point. So you're going to see different manifestations. And then whenever you have what we call these partial or focal seizures, um, the danger many times is that they can spread. And when they spread throughout the whole brain, you have something called a secondary generalized seizures. So some people have what we call generalized epilepsy where they always have seizures that affect the whole brain. Other times you can have what we call secondary generalized because some of the focal seizures get together and they spread throughout the brain and mm. then cause the seizure to be throughout the brain. So you can see in those um, individuals both partial seizures, that depending on where there might be one part of the brain having a seizure, or it may manifest with, um, with uh, the whole brain having a seizure. Now, with children, earlier you had said um, regarding seizures that you have this kind of seizure that we're talking about, and then you have other ones that are provoked, I believe was the word you used. Um, so I was thinking of when I was a kid, and I've had a couple since I was an adult, but they were provoked by high fever, right? Um, and so when you have a child with autism, do you have to worry about a provoked seizure um, as well if they already have, let's say, epilepsy? Now with a high fever, is that something also that we have to have some type of concern? So all the time, so for care for seizures, um, definitely we know that any type of physiological stress is going to decrease the seizure threshold. Mm -hmm. So things like fever, just illness, you don't have to have um, a fever all the time, mm -hmm. but any type of um, illness. Other things like poor sleep, um, um, poor nutrition, you know, um, uh, uh, not being hydrated in the heat, all of these things, anything, even physiological, even, I'm sorry, psychological stress mm -hmm. can um, provoke seizures. So anybody that has epilepsy, not just children with autism, um, we say they have to be especially careful about keeping themselves well. That's good to know. Now, my next question is regarding EEGs. So I know many families out there, we've, we've done them as a prevention or maybe just an insight into our child's brain to see maybe what's going on. I know in the biomedical community that it's, it's recommended at least to have one or two within that child's uh, time frame or life of, um, if, and then if no seizures happen, that's fine, but that you kind of, if you're watching and you're, you're a family listening, um, 
it's really important to kind of know what is going on in that child's brain and to do a, tw a minimum of a 24 hour EEG was what was recommended uh, to us. Um, if you can do longer, I, I hear that's better. I know some insurance may or may not cover um, longer. I hear 72, you might have a different um, idea, but I hear 72 is the best. I know most insurances don't want to cover that unfortunately. So a lot of us do 24 hour, you know, EEGs. Now here's my question. I've talked to many people where we've had totally fine what they call clean EEGs um, throughout that child's life. I've had five 24-hour EEGs done with Jackson throughout his life. I had one done 30 days approximately prior to his big seizure. We actually knew he finally had a seizure. I had that one done because I really felt there was some, and we'll get into this as well, um, some symptoms that I thought might be looking like seizures, even though it wasn't the quote-unquote seizure. So I thought, well, let's do another EEG and let, let's see what we see. Never had he had anything um, irregular on his EEGs. A top neurologist at one of the hospitals uh, in here in Southern California looked at us and said, this child does not have seizures. The child's not going to have seizures. Everything is fine. I wouldn't even waste any more time doing EEGs. Approximately 30 days later, the ambulance picking him up and he had a full-blown seizure. So my, you can only imagine my thoughts to that neurologist, right? <laughs> because <laughs> I thought, I knew, you know, as a mom, you feel like this instinct, like something's not right. And I think as mommies and daddies out there, we got to follow our instincts and really get these doctors like yourself who do listen to us, but not every doctor does, right? So why do we have clean EEGs? And then our children are having seizures still. It gets so mind-boggling. Yeah, you know, I usually, so um, I, I most of my patients, I recommend a 24-hour overnight EEG. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if you have a clean 24-hour EEG, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's with the caveat that many times you can have epilepsy and you can have normal EEGs. Mm -hmm. Just think that if there's something to catch on the EEG, probably 24 hours is, is pretty good to catch something. Mm -hmm. You may still have a clean EEG and still um, have epilepsy. I usually recommend uh, overnight EEGs for kids that have staring episodes um, or have really poor language development or mm -hmm. other cognitive symptoms. Um, other kids with autism that, um, that don't have any staring episodes that, that are pretty well, you know, uh, you know, uh, at least somewhat interactive, um, that have language skills, that have okay language skills, I usually don't do an overnight EEG. One of the things, we, we did do one study where we looked at um, kiddos with um, subclinical discharges, and we found that most of them had speech or language impairment. Okay. So if a child doesn't have speech or language impairment, um, and they don't have staring episodes, I may not do an EEG. But for most young kids, I will. Uh, most of your own kids. Now, you have a really good point. I get asked this a lot about older children mm -hmm. you know, because there's this idea that, you know, there may be this onset of uh, mm -hmm. epilepsy. And many parents want to do an EEG just in case for, for older children. But it really seems like the, uh, the literature supports that the abnormal EEGs tend to normalize um, in late childhood mm -hmm. um, and they tend to be more normal. Even if they could have seizure activity. Yeah, yeah. So um, unless they're having symptoms where they mm -hmm. have staring episodes, let's say an older kid with staring episodes um, or, again, poor language development or some reason that's going to make me do an EEG, um, I may not even do an EEG because what we find is that on the new onset seizures um, mm -hmm. later on, just don't seem to have any rhyme or reason as far as having um, really a signature of abnormal activity on the EEG. Well, then that makes sense for us then of why our, our EEG was clean and yet... That's a typical, yeah, that, you know, yeah. Um, and, and I'm sure the neurologist was trying to do, you know, the best and give you the best advice. Um, but, um, you know, one thing if you work with enough children with autism is, you know, you, you never say never. Yeah. Every child's different and they always fool you. So, yes. Yeah. yeah, the minute you think they're going to turn left, they're going to turn right, do a yeah. U-turn, go back left, and turn right again. <laughs> oh, and this neurologist wasn't somebody that works with autism. This was just a general neurologist at the hospital that were considered, you know, somebody we wanted to have a second look at, you know, uh, and to make sure. And, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. And, you know, we are where we are, and we just keep on moving forward. Now, my question, my next question is, this medication um, that every 
families giving to their children with autism. So when I started learning about seizures and epilepsy, and, and I just don't know anything really, I'm still learning, which I love these summits because I get to learn along with all the parents, right? Um, so there's so many medications out there, right? And there's just, and it's like you don't know which way to turn and we can try this one, but then maybe you need a little bit of that one and then you get this one and well, maybe that didn't work, but maybe we got to up the dose. And how as, you know, a specialist in this, how do you know which drug is going to work and, 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 and do you have to be on these drugs for the rest of your life and, you know, all that, all the above. <laughs> right. So I think now, you know, we have the advantage that we have a lot of new medications that are very safe. So uh, many of us, I think, try to go with the first line medications uh, as far as safety. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and that may, it may or may not be, um, uh, the, the, the best, you know, thing to do. So I'll tell you that in our, in our seizure survey study um, that um, we did, that I did with uh, Dr. Adams, and also, um, we also did a systematic review in, in, um, in um, on the uh, literature on uh, treatment of seizures and autism um, many years back um, as part of a seizure think tank. And we found that the uh, the drugs that had the best efficacy um, or, uh, uh, or were um, thought by parents to be most useful uh, mm -hmm. were uh, Depakote, Lamictal, and Keppra. Okay. okay. Um, and that was kind of when Keppra was one of the new drugs. So mm -hmm. now we have newer drugs, but we don't have any data on how they work um, in autism. So I usually start with one of those three drugs. Each one of them has its positives and negatives. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know that a lot of families don't like the idea of Depico because you need to have um, uh, many times multiple blood tests because it affects uh, the liver and the blood cells and, and such. Um, uh, Lamictal is a very good drug. Um, it's very helpful, although I've seen um, some children um, have the opposite effect mm -hmm. uh, because it's supposed to be behaviorally um, stabilizing and sometimes it isn't for some reason in mm -hmm. some kids with autism. Um, so you have to be careful. And then uh, Kepra is a very safe drug, um, but there's many children with autism that um, behaviorally don't uh, tolerate it very well. Um, I, I usually try it. I think it's worth a try because it doesn't have any serious side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's worth a try. Um, all those medications in our seizure survey were rated as actually um, controlling seizures very well, um, but um, they um, all seem to have um, some negative side effects on some of the um, other aspects of behavior or sleep or other things uh, regarding autism. Um, there's other treatments um, that, uh, that um, are not anti-epileptic medications like the ketogenic diet or the Atkins mm -hmm. diet, which... Um, tend to be uh, uh, not only help with seizures, but um, seem to have um, at least some data that suggests they also help with autistic behaviors. Mm -hmm. So there's other um, possibilities um, of other treatments that uh, can be used. It's important to be on some type of anti-epileptic medication, I think, if you have seizures, mm -hmm. uh, just because of what we talked about, the, um, the dangerous status epilepticus, um, the danger of SUDEP. So I think that uh, it's always important to choose some type of anti-epileptic medication, you know, guided by your doctor. And many times you do have to um, try um, certain ones to see what is best for your child. Sometimes, um, and I think this is um, just a theme in autism, you know, many children with autism just don't react to medications like <laughs> other kiddos, and you can't predict it. So you have to be very careful. Yeah, it's, um, I know with us, we were on one, it seemed to be working, then it, I don't know what it was, uh, almost a month later, it didn't, it, we had a seizure, so then we um, added something else that seemed to be working, then that didn't, then we upped this part of it, and now, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful we've been seizure-free for a few months, and that's always a good thing, um, but I do agree, there. I think that there's side effects, and you get other behaviors at different points, and now we're working on that. Do you see aggression um, or sleep issues or, um, you know, speech issues? Like, do you see, what, is, what are some of the things you see as side effects, you know, with those that are newly on medication, or, or is there just, you know, drowsiness? I'm not sure. 
Yeah, so the major major side effect of almost any anti-epileptic medication um, is uh, drowsiness, mm -hmm. uh, tiredness, slowing of cognition, uh, tremor, unsteadiness. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are uh, kind of general um, uh, uh, side effects. In individuals with autism, yeah, we tend to see more behavior. Sometimes mm -hmm. we see aggressive behavior, irritability, mm -hmm. uh, poor attention, poor cognition, poor mm -hmm. language. Um, so um, whenever that happens, you have to watch for that. So you have to watch for that carefully and understand that can be a side effect. And many times you have to change medications. To help the, the, and I think that's important for families to know because I've talked to a lot of families and they didn't know that maybe a great, like they got rid of the seizures, but then all of a sudden this other stuff started popping up and then they didn't even put two and two together to realize, oh, wait a second, the medication might be causing this. And then they did switch medications and then all of a sudden, the seizures were gone and these behaviors were gone. And, and I think often you're just thinking of seizures be gone, be gone. <laughs> and you're not thinking of this other stuff that could pop up. Yeah, and it can be medications. It can be other things. So there's also a, ph a phenomenon called forced normalization mm -hmm. uh, that I think people didn't understand. And, and that is when you have a kid with really bad epilepsy mm -hmm. um, that, um, that the, the brain has so much seizure. And this is a, a child, let's say, they, if you do an EEG, they have lots and lots of seizure activity going on. And then you treat that, um, and, um, um, and the seizures go away. Um, but their behavior just becomes terrible. Um, mm -hmm. And there, you, you, um, it, it's, um, I don't think everybody agrees on it, of why that is, but it may very well be that um, if the brain isn't working at all, mm -hmm. you, know, you may not see much behavior, mm -hmm. uh, but um, then you actually uh, solve the problem of having all the seizure activity in the brain, and the brain kind of wakes up, but it mm -hmm. hasn't matured at all, and suddenly mm -hmm. it just has all this input, um, from the surroundings, you know, a, into a very immature brain. And so you can see a lot of um, anxiety, a lot of behavior, a lot of attention deficit, what looks like attention deficit um, problems, which you may need to manage with other medications. So it's not as simple as, well, one medication, you know, be, can be causing that. And sometimes we actually see by treating the seizures, some of these behaviors arise because you're actually kind of opening up part of the brain that, you know, was offline for a long period of time, and now the brain has to actually mature. Now, isn't that fun? <laughs> It's like, we already got this, and we go, I, I always joke, you know, like, I'm so tired of these membership cards. Give me one to Club Med. I don't want any more of these other ones. Because we're, we, we're constantly, I feel like it's like this kind of, um, I almost feel like it's like a boat that, like, there keeps springing a link, and then we, like, fix one link, and then, boom, another link happens. And then, and it's just this constant, like, we're on the middle of the sea just trying to, like, survive in this boat. <laughs> and we're just pushing out all the different leaks. And so, um, but, you know, what I love is that, I know I don't know all the answers, and I know a lot of people watching, they're feeling the same way I am, but the thing I love is that there's doctors out there like you that we're not giving up on people like us saying, hey, I don't, I don't know which one it's going to be, but we're going to go ahead and try this. Okay, now let's go ahead and try that. And, you know, we live in a day and age where there's lots of options, and so we don't know what's going to work for every single person. And so um, I, wish it, I wish we did. It would be so nice if you're like, and here's the combo, 714, done. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about CBD only because it's a big hot topic. When we talk about seizures, people are talking about CBD. Um, and so, you know, what is your take on CBD? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really promising area uh, of treatment for a lot of things. Um, you know, we know that um, in neurology, it seems to be helpful for, um, for certain indications. Um, one of the promising indications um, is uh, seizures and epilepsy, um, but I think we're, we really are kind of in the infancy in understanding that. Um, um, I think that, of course, one of the things I'll say it's important for um, parents to understand the difference between CBD and medical marijuana, okay? CB, uh, CBD is the uh, non-psychoactive part um, of the plant, um, and um, it's from hemp, or, uh, or um, and uh, and and that's important because um, we think that when you add some of the psychoactive portions like THC, it's kind of a wild card as of how it will react. So I think most of the data we have is on CBDs and not medical medical marijuana. So I think you have to be really careful about that. 
about using medical marijuana because it's very uncontrolled and it has many different mixtures. Um, you don't know the right, you don't know the, I know lots of people that are on it and it's helpful. Um, and I know that sometimes you just don't know for the right dose and, and, and they don't know the right dose to give. And it's, it's one of those things where they'll say, you know, we'll try this and then, okay, well, go this way and then go that way and until so you can kind of find your right balance but you're right, right. There's, it's, and the yeah. products are regulated so the balance may be different you know next month as it is you know uh, you know uh, this month so i would caution against using medical marijuana um you know now cbds i think are, um, are somewhat promising and then i think you need to also um, be aware about uh, the laws in the state so that's always important you don't want to get yourself in trouble Mm -hmm. you know, um, with using any of these products. Um, CBDs, if uh, somebody has to use CBDs, they have to realize that some companies um, have something called a certificate of analysis, where they'll actually tell you what's in the CBD. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll know um, exactly um, what's in the product, whereas there'll be other companies that won't give you any analysis. And I know they just did a study here in Arizona um, for some of the uh, medicinal products and they actually found that I think five of seven of the products had absolutely nothing in them. Oh my goodness. And, and they're charging a fortune for yeah, to some of these families. What were, that's what they were saying is that, you know, they're charging a fortune these, and, and uh, families are paying thousands of dollars and they're getting absolutely nothing. Um, wow. So if you're going to use any of these products, um, of sure course, you know. it's good to go with companies that actually will give you a certificate of analysis. Uh, my advice is not to go it on your own, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, it's become so popular. There's many clinical trials mm -hmm. um, for CBDs around the country uh, at many universities um, and, and non-university uh, research centers. Um, and if you can um, get into one of those clinical trials, um, it'd probably be best because it will be controlled. You know there's a qu uh, quality product. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that there's somebody with knowledge that's going to be prescribing it. And you're also um, going to be um, contributing to the knowledge that we know about so that we can know how to use these products in the future. And I think it's definitely very hopeful. I mean, we've all heard of Charlotte's Web. We've all heard. I mean, that just seems to be the most popular one. I know there's many others that are out there. Um, even the Autism Hope Alliance, we have partners that, you know, carry the different brands. Um, but you know, for me, when you read a story and you hear somebody that nothing worked for them and then it worked, I mean, it's something similar with all of autism and, and I'm sure other, uh, you know, different challenges that people have. Um, and the thing is though, it's not a one size fits all. What I'm excited about is that there is hope out there and there's these products that are coming to light and, you know, more companies are having to stand up and say, yeah, this was in my product. And because there's families and doctors like us out there saying, hey, you know what? Stop playing around with our free, our kids' health. I mean, it's super, we're paying you all this money. Give us a good product. Maybe it will work. Maybe it won't. What I love, what I do love with uh, the thought about CBD, though, is that I feel if it does work and that's something that they can take. Gosh, what a! I feel like what a better way to go if that works. You know, but again, you know, we have to learn more. And for those that it is working, oh. I just feel like he won the lottery, he won the jackpot because <laughs> you just don't, I know with our son, it's like, we try this, we try this, we try this, and some things stick and some things don't. It reminds me when I was in college and I'd make pasta and I'd like throw it to the wall to see if it stuck, you know, and most of the time it didn't. <laughs> it's kind of in that same situation. I think seizures and autism are, you know, very, very scary, scary thing. And for me as a mom, I just keep trying to learn as much as I can, you know, um, I know Prior to seizures, I said, I don't want to know anything about it. And, you know, I've been to, I don't even know how many conferences. Of course, I've heard, you know, the whole time I've been in the autism world. But I purposely didn't want to learn a lot about it because I said, well, I'm not going to be in that group. So I don't want, I don't even want the universe to think I want to know about that because I don't want to have anything to do with that. And, and here we are. Now, my last question um, is, do you have to be on medication for the rest of your life um, once you quote-unquote, get that uh, label of uh, epilepsy? Sure, no. You know, and, and well, we know that um, in uh, typically developing children, many times um, after you've had a seizure, um, after you've had two seizures, of course, um, the, usually the way we treat um, seizures in, uh, in typically developing children is if you have one seizure, um, we know that you're very unlikely to have another, so we usually don't treat them. If you have two seizures, that's the definition of epilepsy. 
We'll start mm -hmm. on a medication. And then in one to two years, we'll repeat an EEG to see if it's clean. Um, and then if it is, take the child off of um, the uh, medication. And to 70 and to 80% of the time, they'll never have another seizure. Of course, okay. I told you about how predictive the EEG is. Of course, it's not perfect, yeah. but, you know, it gives you a good indication. Um, for um, And so it depends on the type of seizures. There's many children with autism that will have uh, seizures that will only last uh, for a period of time. If they're well controlled for a period of time and you repeat an EEG and it seems to be um, normal and the child doesn't seem to be having any more seizures, then it's definitely um, something to try to uh, stop the medication. So not everybody has to be on... Um, Do you have to go low and slow off the medication? Uh, usually you taper. Yeah, uh -huh. it's always a good idea to taper it off. Uh, well, that's a, that's a very positive note. That was something I didn't know till right now. I mean, I, every time I'm giving his meds, I'm like, oh my goodness, does he have to do this the rest of his life? Um, you know, I'm really hoping not. Um, if you know me, I'm from the natural world, and you know, I I'm not a I believe in RX medication when you need it, and um, clearly that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And uh, but I would much prefer. I think nobody wants to be on medications the rest of their life, you know. So it's uh, not something. It's a good idea to be on medications you don't have to be on. But if you need exactly. to be on them, they're there, you know, exactly. and they're important when you need them. Absolutely. Well, if you guys have loved, I mean, I've learned, clearly I'm a little biased because I'm in this world of seizures and <laughs> autism. And, but I, and I hope that you guys understand that this is something we all need to learn about because regardless if your child is not in this membership club you know, I hope they never are. I truly, truly do. But I think it's important for you to look for signs and symptoms and then know what to do if you feel as though your child might be having a seizure. It's always good to, you know, check that off the that is not happening uh, box versus later going, gosh, I wish I would have, you know, learned more about that. You know, obviously I knew somewhat about it is why I want to do the EEG and that kind of thing. Um, but you know, we don't want anybody in this membership club, but we're here. And, you know, with 40% of us, most likely at some point potentially going to have a seizure um, at either, you know, prior to six and maybe in puberty, we got to learn everything we can. And um, so if you guys want to, you know, have Dr. Fry in your living room and have, because your significant other didn't get to watch this this week, or you want your family member to watch it, or you know your friend down the street really should have watched this, super easy. All you have to do is go to AutismHopeSummit.com. You can buy the whole summit of over 25 top leading experts in their field talking about things that we all need to know about. Now, here's the best part. Every single time you go to um, buy part of the package or you buy the packages, those dollars raised go back to the Autism Hope Alliance, and it goes into our nutritional scholarship fund so we can continue to help more and more families across the world. I know last year we had over 160 countries watching or listening to our summit. You can even get last year's summit and the year before, so you have a whole amount of information that are at your fingertips because we're here to help you guys in our best way. So. Dr. Fry, I know that you are so busy. I know trying to even get this interview was just like, I was like sitting there going, oh, I hope we can have him. I hope we can have him because I know you're just all over the world. You know, what is the final message you want to leave people with today? Well, I, I think what you were saying, there's always hope. Mm -hmm. I think you always have to be pushing forward um, to really make sure that uh, you find the best thing for your child and, and for your life and to make um, your life as and your child's life as, as best um, as you can. And I think there's many, there's always, there's always reasons to go forward, always reasons to look for answers um, and to search for answers. Absolutely. And guys, again, just remember, there is always hope. We keep saying this every single lecture you're watching right now. We're saying every person saying the same thing. There's hope. There's hope. This whole summit is called Hope with a Plan. We're actually giving you those tools. So we're not giving up. Just know that these doctors aren't giving up on us. And we're just going to keep on moving forward because the only way is up, right? So thank you guys for watching. And until next time. Bye, guys.